right. So now that we have discussed electron configuration and how they fill the various uh, levels, sublevels, and orbitals, we are going to look at the periodic table and we're going to look at the trends that you see in the periodic table. Uh, trends regarding chemical activity and elemental size and so on. Now, um, uh, the patterns in the periodic table uh, have been around for a while, or at least people noticing them have been around for a while. Uh, back in 1829, a guy named Dubreiner, this German, noticed triads, you know, a trio of three elements that have similar properties where the uh, central atom has the average mass of the other two, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, three halogens, for example. Then you get a Frenchman, Jean Courtois. Um, he noticed that if you uh, put the elements in order of atomic weight and wrap them around a column, then you get periodicity. That's uh, more or less uh, the, the same thing. It's kind of an innovative way to do it. Uh, then you get an Englishman named Newlands in 1864 who uh, noticed that they could be arranged in octaves. Um, this got him made fun of. Uh, you have his octaves up here. And it got him made fun of because, uh, well, um, people asked him to play songs with his elements. Um, people were kind of weird. And um, he was kind of right. I mean, we know now what the octaves are, where they come from. Because two S electrons plus six P electrons is a total of eight. So that's where his octaves came from. And you can see that hydrogen, then fluorine, then chlorine, then you have lithium and sodium and potassium. Uh, uh, G, that's probably... Huh, that, that's interesting. Anyway, you still see the same patterns in uh, the elements that we have today. They're, they're all, they are now in what was the, the same column. Um, it was Mendeleev who put them in uh, more or less their current order, uh, rearranging as necessary um, to make things better fit his uh, model and leaving gaps where uh, elements had not yet been discovered. And he did that, you see, in 1869, whereas uh, uh, quantum mechanics didn't actually become a thing until the 20th century. So he was three decades ahead of his time in that fashion. So, um, the modern periodic table is built around atomic number, not atomic weight. Uh, you'll, you'll recall that atomic number is the number of protons. Um, so hydrogen atoms always have a single proton. Helium atoms always have two. Lithium atoms always have three, so on. Um, and what that means is that the protons um, give you the depth of the well, the, the, the potential energy well. You could say that Earth is in a gravity well, that uh, when things fall down, they're falling down the Earth's gravitational potential energy. Well, th when you have protons, then you have an electrical potential energy well, and the electrons will fall down into it. Okay. So... Um, the protons provide the depth of the well and the nature of the electrons, the, the fact that they have a negative charge, that they have a certain mass, and that only two of them can fit in a certain orbital, is what gives us atomic orbitals and the chemical properties of the elements. And finally, the atomic orbitals and you know, how, how big they are and what shapes they have is what lends us the uh, shape of the periodic table. Okay, so... The connection between group and valence. You remember that the valence electrons are the outermost electrons. Um, oh, I hate when that happens. Um, the outermost electrons. Uh, so, um, for hydrogen, its single electron is its valence electron. You come down to lithium, it has two core electrons. It's one. It's one s electrons and a single. Uh, uh, valence electron in the 2s subshell. And then sodium and potassium each have a single uh, valence electron. So the columns, these all represent different columns in the periodic table, uh, represent the valence of the elements. Okay? Every uh, element in the same column will have the same 
arrangement of valence electrons, or at least very, very similar. Because, like I said, there are sometimes exceptions, such as silver. Okay, so the uh, second column, you have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. You come over here to the carbons column, they have 2s2, 2p2, 3s2, 3p2, and so on. You see a slight change down here, and that you also have d uh, subshells that are uh, entirely full. But those count as uh, core electrons because they're full. So they also have 2s electrons and 2p electrons. 2s electrons, 2p electrons. So they have the similar sort of chemistry. Then you have the halogens, and then you have the noble gases. Okay? Similar valence, similar chemistry. Now, uh, to help us understand some of the later trends, uh, we're going to talk about uh, effective nuclear charge. Okay. Uh, Z is the number that we use to represent the number of protons in the element. So Z effective is the effective number of protons. Okay. How much of the nucleus do your valence electrons see? So to find effective nuclear charge, you take the total number of protons, and then you subtract the core electrons. Okay. That will get you effective nuclear charge. So remember how I said, uh, here's your nucleus, here's your core electrons, and then here's your valence electrons. Okay. Well, the core electrons are in between the valence and the nucleus, so they act as a shield blocking some, but not all, of the nuclear uh, pull, the pull of the nucleus, the nuclear charge. Okay. So, uh, for example, we take a look at carbon. Carbon has six protons, okay. and carbon's uh, um, uh, uh, electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So it has two core electrons, or valence electrons, and the effective nuclear charge is Z minus 2, 6 minus 2 equals 4. And no, it's not a coincidence that uh, the effective nuclear charge is equal to the number of valence electrons. Okay, it's it's um, pretty much always going to be equal to the number of valence electrons. Uh, the the effective nuclear charge can get kind of strange when you're looking at the transition metals, um, but it works just fine for the S block and the P block. And of course, as per usual, we're going to completely ignore the F block because they are satanic and we hate them. But effective nuclear charge is uh, a useful tool for understanding uh, some of the periodic trends, such as atomic radius. Okay. Uh, radius is, you know, just taking a quick reminder. Okay. If you're looking at a circle or a sphere, and the radius is the distance from the center to the edge. Okay. So atomic radius is the distance from the center of the nucleus to the edge of the electron cloud. Okay. So there are two things to keep in mind. Uh, the first is energy level. Every time you go up an energy level, say from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, you're going further out from the center of the nucleus. So the first, the second, the third, the fourth, they're always getting further away. So every time you go down a row in the periodic table, you're going up an energy level. Yeah, I know, it, it's, it's painful. But uh, you're getting further away from the edge of the nucleus. So the lower you get, the bigger the atoms are. Okay, the heavier things are at the bottom of the periodic table, the bigger things are at the bottom of the periodic table. The other thing is that uh, you also have to take into account uh, uh, the effective nuclear charge. Okay. As you go from left to right on the periodic table, effective nuclear charge is increasing. Well, the math is fairly straightforward. Uh, but what it gives you is, you know, you know, this column, they all have one uh, valence electron. They all have a valence or a, an effective nuclear charge of one, effective nuclear charge of two, 
pick up nuclear charge of three, four, five, six, seven, and zero. Remember, no valence electrons for the noble gases. So, um, that means that effective nuclear charge is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. The effective nuclear charge always increases as you go right along the periodic table. Okay? The core is staying the same size, but the nucleus is getting bigger. So, bigger nucleus, stronger pull. The core is staying the same. So, the core is staying the same. So, nucleus nucleus core valence bigger nucleus same size core bigger valence okay so the shield is the same size in both of these so it can only block so much but say this guy has four this guy has six protons then you're going to have uh, two electrons in the shield Gonna have two valence and four valence. Okay, so four versus two, six versus four. Um, these will be pulling on each other much more strongly than these over here will. Which means that even though I've drawn them bigger, what actually happens is as you go from left to right along the periodic table. the elements are getting smaller. It's not as big a difference as I've drawn here, necessarily, uh, but it is there. It's, uh, it is significant, and you need to be aware of it. And of course, as you go from top to bottom, they get bigger, you know, sometimes a lot bigger. Going from one energy level to the next is a, a pretty big jump. Okay. So that means that when you look at the periodic table, the smallest atoms are up here in the upper right, fluorine and hydrogen. The biggest atoms are in the lower left, you know, francium, rubidium. So up here, the smallest, down here is the biggest. Because bottom has uh, the, 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 the highest energy level, so they're furthest away, and it has a really weak effective nuclear charge, so the nucleus isn't pulling very hard on that uh, distant energy level. Next up, we have ionization energy and electron affinity. Uh, these are sort of semi-hemi-demi, kind of the same thing, okay? The ionization energy, i.e., is the energy required to remove an electron. Okay. Uh, remember, positive and negative charges attract, so when you want to get an electron away from that, you're pulling it away from the nucleus. You have to put energy in to get the electron out. Okay. Electron affinity is kind of the opposite. It's the energy needed, <clears throat> or the energy released, when you add an electron to an atom. Okay. So, you know, this follows, uh, you have to, you know, take into account the same uh, two things uh, the size of the atom so how distant the energy or the, the outermost electrons are and the effective nuclear charge okay. the bigger the atom the further the electrons are from the nucleus so they're going to be easier to remove okay. so lower in the periodic table lower ionization energy okay. but higher effective nuclear charge means that the nucleus is pulling harder on those uh, valence electrons so they're going to be harder to remove. Okay. So it looks kind of like the opposite of atomic radius. The highest uh, energies, you know, the highest ionization energies, the highest electron affinities are going to be up here in the upper right. And that's going to be the opposite down here. Lower left, the biggest atoms with the lowest effect of nuclear charge are going to have the lowest ionization energy, the lowest electron affinity. And that makes 15 minutes. So we will continue with our discussion of trends in the periodic table in lecture 16.